the next module is on the temporal characteristics of, of the EEG signal. So uh, the time expression. Uh, these are not the same time scales here uh, in these two graphs. This is 25 milliseconds here, and this is 250 milliseconds down here. But this is what you observe when you put a clamp, an electrical clamp, on one neuron. Uh, so it has some activity here. Then you apply some input, say some voltage, and then it starts to fire or spike. Um, so it goes up, and then it resonates and fires again. And the firing rate uh, may, to some extent, encode the um, the output signal, you know, sort of signal strings in some way. Um, and now the EEG is, of course, an average of millions of firing processes. And so you never see individual spikes. But you may see something in higher frequencies, like 100 hertz, that is stronger when you have more spiking behavior and so on. And all the lower frequency things, like 10 hertz, 20 hertz, are all synchronized oscillations. Uh, and then on top of that, there's tons of noise, of course. Um, there's sensor noise. There's, um, there's externally induced noise, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now when you take this somewhat undecipherable signal and average many, many instances of the same brain process, like you, um, you have an event, and you repeated that event, say, 100 times because you presented to the person 100 times the same thing. Um, and if you average all that, you think all the variation, all the randomness averages out, cancels each other out. And the only stuff that remains is basically what's systematic across all these instances. And uh, that's something that we call an event-related potential. It's the potential that is related to this event. In this particular case, what happened was there was a word being presented. And in some cases, the um, word was uh, I actually don't entirely know. It was expected or not expected, or correct or wrong. And um, so you get, if you compare you know, correct versus incorrect, you get different kinds of time courses in this particular case. All the corrects, red, all the incorrects, blue or so. And uh, when you subtract them, you see just from the EG average whether that was a correct word or not. Uh, and that's um, that's a way to infer something about cognitive state. But the trouble is to do this not in an average, but to do it in a single trial, which looks like this, maybe. Um, so you have a stimulus. This is from actual data. Here's a stimulus, and here's a person committing an error. Sure, there's something, but it looks very much like just about you know, any other kind of bump or spike. And for this, you have to tell whether the person made an error here or not. Um, and so that requires pattern recognition, machine learning, it's usually not visible by plain eye. You know, you can kind of forget it. You also usually need to integrate multiple of these time series, say 20 or 30 or so, and subtract them in the right way to, to find a discernible signal. The oscillations that I mentioned look different. Um, here's a few examples of, this is one second by the way, of so-called alpha oscillations. They happen at about 10 hertz, so it's a low frequency hum. Um, and they usually happen in bursts. So here you see alpha burst, and it is suppressed here. It comes again, suppressed. Um, that's a person who is probably flipping back between idling and, and being attentive or something like that. So if you close your eyes, you exhibit bursts like that. Or if you're really, really tired and about to drop out or zone out, then you get these things as well. Um, and depending on the frequency, we call them differently. So we say delta is low frequency, 0 to 4 hertz. Theta oscillations are 4 to 7 hertz. Alpha oscillations are 8 to 13 hertz. Beta oscillations are 12 to 30. And gamma oscillations are 25 to 100. And there is also low gamma and high gamma and uh, so on. The crossover might be around maybe 45 hertz. So um, these things, this is probably just raw EEG, are, are pretty strong because of this power of, of synchrony in the EEG. Um, also, um, let's say we know something about where these things tend to be um, present. So for example, the upper rhythm is strong in occipital cortex. And then there are certain kinds of so-called theta bursts or so in certain other areas. But I'm not going to go into details. There's about as many 
cases as there are papers on these kinds of processes.